Ignition sequence start. Six, five, four, three, two, one, zero. Liftoff. We have a liftoff. Hey everybody, this is the di sorry I said that wrong. Hey everybody, this is the digital asset investor, and I was going to start this video out by showing you ProCoinNews.com uh, American Crypto Innovation Under Siege ticker, and it is moving. We're at 309 days, 13 hours, 57 minutes, six seconds on the uh, counter. SEC versus Ripple, or um, SEC versus Ripple, SEC and Ethereum versus Ripple slash XRP slash crypto innovation in the United States. All right, moving on. Um, the Joker, who is retired. Happy Black Friday. This is from yesterday, I guess. I'm getting some XRP below a dollar, and uh, DG, he, he likes Digibyte too, below five cents. Um, to be honest, I didn't expect to see such levels again. Awesome. I'm going to be accumulating XRP below a dollar as well. So, um, and then uh, Crypto Bull weighed in yesterday as well and says 13 to $15 still in play for XRP. That's what we like to hear. Um, I'm not going to play this video, but I am going to, I just wanted to make a point here. This is the point I woke up with this morning. Remember that time some random guy sued Ripple claiming they sold him an Ill illegal security? He had, he had only lost some tiny amount. Uh, he bought like a very, uh, it wasn't much, but it, I think he lost like one or 200 bucks. It was something like that. Then he sued Ripple saying basically that um, they sold him a security, which they didn't even sell it to him. He bought it on the secondary market, but that um, it was a security. And so he sued Ripple. Well, this right here, the, this little video is a, uh, this was an email that was going around this week where the SEC, someone asked the SEC if Ethereum was a security and the and at the SEC replied from an SEC email address and said that uh, Ethereum, it, they have not decided whether Ethereum is a security. They haven't weighed in on that yet. So I was sitting there reading that and I was thinking, man, the plaintiff attorneys must be seeing this lining up because they've got a letter in their hand. They didn't have this when, when that guy sued Ripple for nothing. But now they've got a letter in their hand that they can point to from the SEC saying, we haven't decided if this is or is not. So um, then there was this. this. This thing was going around this morning, and I just wanted to show a little bit of it. How Ripple could be forced to burn XRP worth $30 billion. And I'm going to read this part. A user on social network ha had asked if nodes validators and the community at large got together and, and we agree that it's better for the community to burn 50 billion XRP that Ripple has in escrow, would it be possible? David Schwartz, Ripple's chief technology officer, subsequently admitted that such a scenario could happen, assuming that the community could get the votes. He wrote, there would be nothing Ripple could do to stop that from happening. Public blockchains are very democratic. If the majority wants a rules change, there is nothing the minority can do to stop them. Um, it's, it's, it's worth noting that such a proposal wouldn't be easy to pull off as it would require an 80% majority from the network's validators. Interesting. I mean, that's an interesting write-up anyway. Um, way, uh, at Crypto Whale, breaking 1 billion unbacked USDT magically printed out of thin air at the Tether Treasury. $1 billion. Folks, this is how, a lot of, most of the time, this is how Bitcoin is going up. Somebody prints Tether, then it's turned into Bitcoin. I mean, we've been watching this movie for a while now. A billion dollars just printed out of thin air. Okay, this is a good clip. That we, we, I can't remember if we ever played you this particular clip. But BitBoy had added this clip from back when he had John Deaton on his show, and he says this is pretty much how the lawsuit is panning out. I feel like I know that settlement is coming, and that uh, you know, really, a lot of this is smoke and mirrors. What what are, what are your overall takes on um, you know uh, this case right now? Any updates? You know, you know, kind of how things transpired. Sure. Well, a lot of people need to understand. You could be uh, absolutely right in the sense that people mistake what's going on on the docket and they think, oh, they're fighting on the docket. That means this or they're silence. This means that 
the the actual the way you settle a case like this is you have two teams ben you have a trial team and you have a settlement team mm. and oftentimes the settlement team it stays out of the way of the trial team and the trial lawyers they're, they're engaged to fight tooth and nail in every battle while the back doors they're having their you know thousand dollar luncheons and and discussing some global settlement and they can come to terms but the devil's in the deep all right I feel like i know so anyway the assuming a lot of people think that there's already a settlement that's done and and we're just watching a movie at this point but in the meantime we have to operate on the assumption that this is still a fight now this was a great tweet from bank xrp iso 222 crypto list five compliant names that will benefit as fed adopts new format 222 update are the following xrp xdc stellar lumens iota algorand the only ones on this list that i am invested in actively right now what i've been doing is buying xrp and buying stellar i do own some algorand and i i like that one because it was hatched out of mit one of gary's buddies the only things i'm investing in are things that i know have worked with different governments around the world because I believe, like Brad Garlinghouse has said, and a lot of people have said, at some point, this whole market is just going to be squeezed into about somewhere between four and 15 digital assets. And those are going to be the ones that change the entire financial system. And I believe that XRP and Stellar are at the very top of that list. I really do. Always have from the inception of this channel. All right, John Deaton said, take a look at the reason the SEC denied providing me with Hinman's calendar. The SEC is claiming that Hinman, Hinman created his calendar for personal use and convenience only. Do you really think his calendar wasn't shared with any other SEC staff to coordinate meetings? And so this is what they said. I think that's going to come back to haunt the SEC right there because there's no way. Now, I, I got up this morning and I was looking around, snooping around for some video. And remember, the Brooklyn Project, that's how Charles Gasparino got into this fight, is that we brought to his attention that he had covered the Brooklyn Project back in May on May 10th of 2018. Look at this little video that I put together. And uh, the two co-chairs of, of this project are here. Patrick Berducci is the Deputy General Counsel at Consensus, and he's co-chair of the Brooklyn Project. Uh, he's, uh, he collaborates with the open source community to develop policies, to facilitate dialogue, and build projects that power and uh, protect and empower the consumers. Uh, Pat's going to be joined on stage with Aaron, who is just with us. He's with Open Law, and he's been instrumental in driving the project forward as co-chair. Okay, so this is the guy. His name's Aaron Wright from o Open Law. He was one of the co-chairs of the Brooklyn Project. Now watch the clip of Gasparino now. And it's created by two, I would say, industry leaders, a guy named Joe Lubin, Andrew Keyes. They, they are part of something known as Ethereum and Consensus. These are big cryptocurrency blockchain companies. Mm -hmm. They are working on this through this thing known as the Brooklyn Project. They have a lot of sources and friends on Wall Street. They are going to lead the effort to essentially systematize and rationalize and create a consumer protection organization through brought with blockchain and cryptocurrency and get, and this is the key thing, because they are working from what I understand with the SEC, the CFTC on this. All right, now I'm gonna pause it there. I wanna make sure you understand what's, what happened here. What the way, the way this was sold back then in 2018 and the way Gasparino presented it, the way it was sold to him, the way it was sold in general, was that you got the Brooklyn Project and you got all these, these law firms, you got the Venture Capital Working Group, and the way they were presenting it was that, hey, oh yeah, we're an industry, we're working on behalf of the industry. But all that came out of it was Bitcoin and Ethereum getting a free pass. And so that's why I've been saying over and over and over. What it's, I believe there was one or two people like Nancy Wotas that were working in good faith, but I think the overall mission that, that maybe people like her didn't really understand was to get Bitcoin and Ethereum a free pass, get Ethereum classified as a, as a commodity, slam the door on all other crypto. That way, Ethereum from that point forward 
could A, continue to uh, build the platform because Ethereum still isn't, it's still proof of work and isn't, is not, it's a, pro, it's a prototype, always was. But let, give it time while you hold the competitors off, okay? Then it becomes a token factory only on Ethereum. Then when DeFi finally comes along, you got a monopoly on the token factory and on DeFi. So what you're seeing here, that same Aaron Wright guy who was with Open Law and was on the was a co-chair for the Brooklyn project, which, which worked on all this in 2018. Then here in 2019 at the SEC FinTech Forum, you got him sitting on stage with the SEC logo behind him and, and the whole cast of characters were there. And he's right there with them. There's Bill Hinman. He was there. That's uh, Valerie Chapinick. She's the one you're supposed to go see to sit down and talk to, to, with her uh, about your crypto project. And like Brad Garlinghouse said, they're basically wanting you to come in so they can then get all your information and go after you in enforcement actions or kill you with a thousand paper cuts. Then we have, this is Aaron Wright. This is Aaron Wright from the Brooklyn Project. And that is Bill Hinman at the, the SEC FinTech Forum in 2019 together, together again. Because make no mistake, the Brooklyn Project, they, they told Gasparino, that, that Andrew Keyes from Consensus told Gasparino but that the, the, they wanted to be SEC sanctioned. That was the goal. And he also said in the reporting that they were working with the SEC and the CFTC. But this puts them in the same room. Bill Hinman and Aaron Wright, one of the people from the Brooklyn Project. And who else is in the room? Well, there's Neha Narula, who is one of, one of uh, Gary Gensler's colleagues at MIT. That's just a coincidence, too. And, of course, we have our old buddy Jay Clayton. Okay? They're all together. All right. Now... I want to show you this. I found this today. This guy's name is Jacob. His name is Jacob Frannick. Okay, and I've told you it was about give a, get Ethereum through the door. Okay, get Ethereum and Bitcoin the commodity um, designation. Then slam the door on all the rest of crypto. Now you got a token factory for Ethereum. Nobody else can just issue tokens at will. Then then DeFi is the next step. Well. If you remember, do you remember when Rosalind Layton wrote the Forbes article where where she was saying this this sham of a thing, this SEC um, thing against Ripple, and then she 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 brought up the Ave, the company Ave, which is a DeFi platform built on Ethereum. Okay, she said they're going after Coinbase, but they're leaving Ave alone, and I knew that she was trying to throw that out so that hopefully someone would grab onto it. That's what I assumed. So check this out. So Jacob Frenick, and I didn't know who he was before I saw this. Look what he said. This is on uh, March 29th of 2018. And I believe that this is just a handful of days after the Venture Capital Working Group did their presentation at the SEC. Okay? Lawyers won't have a clear answer, either just opinions. Would love to hear from them, uh, them too, but ultimately it will take time to sort out. Many lawyers are working with the SEC on this. So he knows that lawyers are working with the SEC. And he says, join the Brooklyn Project Telegram if you want to follow the legal discussions. So he knows that the Brooklyn Project is working with the SEC. And I did, this just came up by me going back during those time periods and searching the words Brooklyn Project and SEC to see what would come up. And this is one of the ones I found. Well, who is Jacob Frenick? Well, he is right here. He's a partner at the DeFi Alliance, all right? So what's the DeFi Alliance? The DeFi Alliance Network is an industry association of stakeholders in the DeFi startup ecosystem. Our members include trading firms, venture funds, exchanges, law firms, code auditors, community builders, and Web3 founders. And anytime you hear Web3, that points straight at Ethereum because that's the, the first place I ever heard that term was from Joseph Lubin, all right? So, that's the DeFi Alliance, okay? Well, this is a tweet from the DeFi Alliance. 
We're, we're thrilled to welcome Ave grants to our ecosystem partnership program. And then go down here, it says, we believe that Ave is a key piece of the DeFi stack and will continue building innovative products across Web3. Ave started as ETH Lend in 2017 and has grown into a community owned and governed interest rate market and thriving ETH ecosystems on Ethereum and Polygon. We expect their massive growth in TVL and adoption to continue with Ave launching markets wherever DeFi uses, users are. So here's my point, folks. Ave obviously isn't being touched by Gary Gensler. Now, remember the other day, Gary Gensler said that DeFi, if you're, if you're going to be paying an interest rate, then that that falls under under the SEC, and we we could come after you. That's why he said they they wanted to shut down the Coinbase lending platform. But these guys are being allowed to do it, and Rosalind Layton made that point. Now, next up, Stefan Huber. From Joseph Lubin's own mouth, I'm selling Ethereum to fund the development of consensus. Asked if he still holds $10 billion worth of Ether, Lubin insists, I've been selling. Unbelievable, this whole SEC Clayton Hinman Ethereum free pass story is just unbelievable. And here it is, rumored to be one of the top buyers, crypto industry insiders. Let's see what it says over here. How Joseph Lubin co-founded Ethereum and scored a billion dollar fortune by Laura Shin. Now she's proud to announce how wealthy he is off of this, but remember, this is the same woman, as I recall, the second that Ripple, that XRP started surging in 2018, she ran out to the, um, to I think the same periodical Forbes and, and wrote an article about how rich Chris Larson was, okay? But here it's like he's a great guy because he's rich, but not, not Chris Larson. It's, uh, with her, it's always been like as if these Ripple guys are bad guys, but it's fine for Joseph Lubin. She wants him to be a trillionaire, I guess. Um, okay, so then there's this. This was another tweet that I found. This is right after the Hinman speech. This is on June 25th, 2018. Token Foundry. This is, the, this is Token Foundry, which is one of the projects that was hatched out of consensus. This is the token factory right here. In light of the SEC's recent uh, comments and leveraging the work of the Brooklyn Project, Token Foundry has formulated an initial set of standards for selling consumer tokens. So th this was when they, they, this was the launch. Once they had Ethereum classified as a commodity, that was their token factory. Step two, one, Ethereum free pass, two, Ethereum token, token creation monopoly, three, Ethereum DeFi monopoly. All right, then how about this? So, so the whole, remember, the whole point, well, well not, not this one, hold on. I wanted to let you see this first. This is Joseph Lubin, just listen to it. It speaks for itself. We drove a bunch of ICO activity. We learned a ton from that. Um, ended up uh, building our Codify Activate platform. So Codify is commerce and decentralized finance. And uh, the Activate platform arose from us uh, working really closely with regulators to help them understand our space and, and to help us understand them um, so that we could issue tokens um, uh, whether they're utility tokens or tokenized securities and uh, and do it properly and so it's, it's really all about how you sell them how you market them and so um, that's one aspect uh, we'll, we'll certainly get back to selling lots of tokens we uh, that was a big part of uh, a previous phase of the company, uh, and we're excited to, to get back to that uh, um, pretty significantly. Um, so, so er think about this for a minute. Think about how crazy this is. Everybody in the in the crypto industry, except for Bitcoin and Ethereum, everybody is begging for clarity. They're like, we don't we don't know what we can do. We don't know if we're, if it's if okay what we're doing or not. But not this guy. This guy. Is bragging about how he was what was the word he used he was driving the ICOs he was driving the ICOs he's bragging about it then he's bragging about how yeah we're about to start issuing a lot of tokens that we're lo really looking for he can just do whatever he wants because this was a monopoly creation and they all knew it folks they knew exactly what they were doing and and that's why none of them will comment now is because they know Nobody, they did not, none of them thought that anybody was going to bring any of this to light. Now, I said this to Gasparino. Remember when Charles Gasparino tweeted this? 
He said SEC enforcement sources tell Fox Business the logic of the agency's case versus Ripple is that the company's infrastructure is still being built out. So XRP, the token, which was used to finance the thing, is considered a security. Infrastructure is totally built out and has been for years. Thus, it's clearly a commodity. Well, tell me if this sound, this is, this is Joseph Lubin, and it's like uh, back in, in 2020. This is Joseph Lubin talking about Ethereum. You tell me if this sounds like an infrastructure. Infrastructure built being built out, education, services and stuff. Um, I guess, are you, are you getting excited for the transition to finally be here? And can you talk to how Consensus is positioning itself to kind of you know, be a part of these two? Um, yeah, I've been excited for Ethereum 2 since about January 2014. Um, literally, the first time we talked about uh, sharding was in that house in Florida in, in January 2014. Um, we knew that we had to build something that uh, was sort of a prototype that worked. And, and the prototype has turned out to be uh, incredibly powerful. So, infrastructure. so in other words, he knew a prototype for crying out loud. The exact opposite is true here. Ethereum never was decentralized. It's a freaking prototype. They, they can't possibly finish the infrastructure. It can't possibly be built out because it's a prototype and they're trying to issue the actual product now. This is a joke. This is a complete joke. And so I, I told Charles Gasparino, I think you need to go back to the SEC and challenge them on this because they just flat didn't tell the truth. And everybody knows it. this isn't some mystery. Well, he responded to me. He says, I think I'm going to let it stand. It's their position and the judge will presumably decide. Well, I 1,000% I disagree with him on that. I think that his, his, he's a journalist and he should go back to them. He ought to go back to them 80 times if, if that's what it takes to, to hold their butts to the fire. Why wait for a judge? That, I mean, if you're a journalist, why wait for a judge? But, you know, I say that, but look, I don't know. I'm not, I'm not trying to criticize him. I'm just saying, I mean, I appreciate everything that he and Eleanor Terrett have done. And I think their, their article the other day is going to help a lot in, in applying a lot of pressure. And maybe he wants to just, maybe he wants to kind of lay low at this point and just see what happens with that. So I'm not trying to jump on him or anything, but, um, if he's not going to ask him, we are. We're going to we're going to keep the pressure on anyway. So okay, um, then, then there's this. Um, I had to put this out. Coincidence. Uh, this is the definition of a coincidence: a remarkable concurrence of events or circumstances without apparent casual connection. This is one billion in Bitcoin and Ether, one river hedge fund to increase holdings from six hundred million to a billion in Bitcoin and Ether. That was on December eighteenth. 2020, December 21st, just a couple of days later, Brad Garlinghouse says, today the SEC voted, voted to attack crypto. Chairman Jay Clayton in his final act is picking winners and trying to limit U.S. innovation in the crypto industry to Bitcoin and Ethereum. All right, so just a hell of a coincidence because what, a month or so later, Jay Clayton goes to One River just days before the SEC brought the Ripple lawsuit. One River announced it would invest all of this in Bitcoin and Ethereum. And then you remember Jay Clayton also said on CNBC that he had never even, he didn't even know of these companies that he later went to work for while he was at the SEC. And we've already proven that that was not true by looking at his own calendar. Now, Mr. B tweeted this out today, and I think this is exciting. Congrats to iTrust Capital. I just saw your national TV commercial. I haven't seen it yet. I want to. Great product, great company. Uh, iTrust Capital, if you're listening, let me know what channel I can see the uh, commercial on. I'd like to go watch. And I went and I saw this. Leading crypto IRA platform, iTrust Capital, drops monthly fees across all client accounts, launches a new client referral program. So they're doing a, um, says uh, they dropped their $29.95 monthly fee on all new and existing accounts. And they've launched a new referral program that offers $100 to the re to, for referring new client funded accounts. We're constantly, da da da, it goes on. We expect that by removing monthly fees and launching our referral program will help us reach a larger audience. 
by combining our features with a wide range of assets, no monthly fees, and rewarding referral program, we believe our platform appeals to a broad range of investors. Big time. Um, I Trust Capital has been one of my sponsors for a long time, and I, in fact, n now they've opened up, they've also opened up ACH transfers. That's what I'm going to be doing this week, is transferring some money into my I Trust account via ACH, because that is going to change the game, in my opinion. I'm the digital, and uh, you, their, their website, by the way, is itrustcapital.com. I'm the digital asset investor. I'm not an investment advisor. This is for entertainment purposes only. Please subscribe, hit the like button, and tell your friends and family, go check out itrustcapital.com. It, it is the number one cryptocurrency investment platform in America.